In the Church of Jesus Christ, there are three great festivals or high holy days. And my guess is that many of us here would probably get a 66% if I were to ask you to list what the high holy days of the church are. I think everybody is aware that Christmas is one of those days. And probably most of us would understand that Easter is also right up there. What you might miss out on is number three, and that is what we're celebrating today. This is Pentecost Sunday. Today is the day we celebrate God pouring out his Holy Spirit on the church. This is literally the birthday of the church. So those are the three high holy days. If you got all three, good for you. I'm, I'm really proud of you. If not, come back again. <laughs> all right, let us turn to God's word and we're turning to the story of Pentecost on this Pentecost Sunday. It is found in Acts chapter 2 and we're going to be looking at the first 18 verses together. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all of these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declare in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will sing visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would open our ears and our hearts to hear what it is your spirit has to say to each of us this day. Add your blessing, we pray, to the reading of your word, and add your blessing to each of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The name Fred Craddock probably doesn't mean a great deal to many of you, but Fred Craddock, uh, who passed away, I think, back in 2015, was a teacher of preachers. He made it his life's work to help other pastors preach better. And Fred Craddock was invited one time to do a lecture series at a particular uh, theological seminary. And as he uh, got ready to start, even before the beginning of the program, he noticed that there was a young man sitting in the audience with his hand in the air. 
wasn't part of the program, but Fred Craddock thought, what the heck, you know, I'll ask him what he wants. And so he did indeed ask what it was that he wanted. And the young man asked, are you Pentecostal? Fred Craddock responded by saying, do you mean do I belong to the Pentecostal church? No. Are you Pentecostal? Okay, you're going to have to help me understand this a little bit. Are you asking me if I'm charismatic? No. Are you Pentecostal? Do you want to know if I speak in tongues? No. Are you Pentecostal? Finally, friend Craddock said, I don't know what you're asking me. And the young man's response was, well, obviously then, you aren't Pentecostal. <laughs> Craddock reflected on that later, and he said, you know, by and large, the church really doesn't understand what it does mean to be Pentecostal. And on this Pentecost Sunday, I want to point us back to God's Word. What does it mean to be Pentecostal? Please note what the story of Pentecost tells us. We know that there were about 120 of Jesus' disciples, about the size of this group maybe, uh, gathered together in the upper room where they had celebrated that first communion. Jesus had told them that they weren't supposed to leave Jerusalem until you receive power from on high. Wait, stay here until something happens. And on this Pentecost Sunday, 50 days after Easter, and for the first 40 of those days, Jesus is kind of just popping in and out of the disciples' lives. Last Sunday was Ascension Sunday, when we remember Jesus ascending up into heaven, and now we're at Pentecost. The disciples are obviously wondering, who's going to lead us now? Jesus has gone back up into heaven. Who's going to lead us now? And as they are praying in the upper room on Pentecost Sunday, the answer comes because God begins to pour out his Holy Spirit upon everyone gathered there, men and women, young and old. The first thing that happens is they hear a mighty rushing wind. Uh, Marty and I spent a good bit of time in Florida. A couple of years ago we were down and uh, we had just gotten there I think the night before. We went to church on Sunday morning and as we're driving from church back to our condo suddenly this hurricane strength wind hits the town we're in. And I mean, there's pieces of palm tree blowing across the road. And we're looking at one another. And we're from Pennsylvania. What do we know about windstorms? But suddenly, in the earliest days of the church, they're sitting inside. And they hear this mighty rushing wind. And then they begin to see something happen. Suddenly, tongues of fire drop down out of the ceiling and land on each one of them so that everybody's got this kind of flame uh, from the top of their head. And then the third thing that starts happening is everybody present starts to talk at the same time. And all of them begin to proclaim the wonderful things that the Lord has done. Now, it's not just the people in the room that hear all this commotion, but even the people outside in the city hear this commotion. And a great crowd of people runs together and they want to know what's happening, what's going on. And they're beginning to hear these 120 folks all 
praising God, but not only just praising God, but praising God in their own language. These are people from all over the Mediterranean world who have come to Jerusalem to celebrate a Jewish feast. So people from all over that part of the world, and every one of them is hearing these 100 disciples, 120 disciples of Jesus praise God in their own language. Some people who see this happening say, well, they're just drunk. Yeah, it's just 9 o'clock in the morning, but they're just drunk. That's what we're witnessing. They've had too much to drink. But Peter, the apostle, stands up before them and says, this is not what many of you suppose. We are not drunk. This is, in fact, what the prophet Joel foretold would happen at the end time. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, Joel said that God would pour out his spirit on all flesh. Your young men would prophesy. Your young women would dream dreams. God is doing a new thing among us. And he says, if you will give your lives to Jesus Christ, I will promise you that two things will happen. Number one, the Lord will forgive your sins. And number two, he will fill you with God's Holy Spirit Amen. as well. A second story comes to us from the book of Acts in Acts chapter 19 when the, the Apostle Paul is visiting the uh, Greek city of Ephesus. When he gets there, he finds some believers already there. And as he, he questions them and gets to know them a little bit, he discovers that whoever brought the message to them told them only about John the Baptist and the baptism of repentance. And the Apostle Paul says, well, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And their response is, no, we didn't receive a Holy Spirit. In fact, we never even heard of a Holy Spirit. And Paul preached to them the good news of Jesus and laid hands upon them and prayed and suddenly the Holy Spirit falls on these Gentile believers, people like us, non-Jews, just as he had back on Pentecost with those Jewish disciples. And so the scripture asks us to ask ourselves, did we receive the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, come upon us when we also believe? Welcome to Aldersgate United Methodist Church. Folks, Aldersgate is named after a street in London, England. And the reason we're called Aldersgate is because the founder of Methodism, John Wesley, who was the son of an Anglican preacher, thought it would be a good idea to become a missionary to the New World to one of the colonies here in the United States back in the early 1720s. And so John Wesley and his brother Charles came to this country, to the state of Georgia. Georgia was originally populated by Britain opening up many of its prisons. Prisoners had the opportunity to emigrate to Georgia rather than remain incarcerated in England. And John Wesley had this wonderful idea of how he was going to come as the son of an Anglican priest and preach the good news of Jesus to the Native Americans and to the new colonists in Georgia and how the Lord was going to use him to bring revival. Didn't quite work out that way. John Wesley got here, got entangled with a young woman by the name of Sophie. Sophie's dad was uh, one of the leaders in the local church and John Wesley kind of dallied with Sophie. He, he, he wanted to get married, but not yet. And Sophie would get tired of waiting for him to ask her. And finally, Sophie dumped him and went with somebody else, and they got married. And John Wesley kicked her out of the church. You can imagine that wasn't too popular with her father. 
In fact, the local residents there in Savannah, Georgia, were going to tar and feather John Wesley. So under cover of darkness, John Wesley had to skedaddle out of Georgia and catch a ship going back to England. And so he arrives back in England as a failed missionary. And while he's in London, somebody invites him to a Bible study. And John Wesley was a great journalist. So we have his journals. We, we know what he wrote and what he did. And he writes in his journals that he went very reluctantly to a Bible study in Aldersgate Street in London. It was on the second floor of the building. And somebody was reading a book that Martin Luther had written. And he says that as they were reading Luther's words, John Wesley felt his heart strangely warmed. And he knew that God loved him. Even him, he says. And John Wesley has a turnaround and his ministry take place at Aldersgate Street that day. In fact, he had a conversation with his dad, Samuel Wesley, and Samuel said on his deathbed to John Wesley that he was supposed to go and preach the inner witness of God's Holy Spirit in his life. Up until that point, Anglican churches all over England were inviting John Wesley to come and preach in their churches because they knew he had just been to Georgia as a missionary. He must have some kind of good stories to tell. But what happens is that John Wesley, as he begins to preach about this indwelling of the Holy Spirit, is branded by the worst name that you can be named in an Anglican church in the 18th century. They call him an enthusiast. He's too enthusiastic about his relationship with the Lord. And so one church after another closes their doors to John Wesley and he can't find a church to preach in. A friend of his comes up to him one day. His name is George Whitfield. George says, John, come and join me and we'll preach outside. Now again, we have all these journals. John Wesley writes in his journal, he thought it was almost a sin that somebody should be saved outside the doors of a church, but he didn't have any options. So he went to his father's last church and he actually stood on his father's tombstone. John Wesley was shorter than me, about five foot four inches tall. And in order to be seen, he stood up on his dad's tombstone and he starts to preach this gospel that includes a message about the Holy Spirit coming and dwelling inside of us and empowering us to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. There were about 5,000 people that gathered outside his father's old church that day. In the months, weeks, years that followed, John Wesley preached outdoors over the length and breadth of England, Ireland, and Wales. Sometimes to as many as 40,000 people at a time without a microphone. And everywhere he went, he preached the good news that we can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we have been saved because God pours his Holy Spirit into us and empowers us to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. On this Pentecost Sunday, I simply remind you of who we are as United Methodists, I encourage you to look at the front of the church. That's the symbol of the United Methodist Church, a cross and a flame. You'll find one also on the end of the church building on the north side. When United Methodists came together in 1968 and were looking for a design to symbolize who we are as United Methodists, they knew that we needed to preach the cross of Jesus Christ because we are saved 
by what God has done for us on the cross of Calvary. But they also knew that from the beginning days of our church, we have proclaimed the Holy Spirit's power at work in and through us to accomplish the purposes of God. My question to you this morning is, on this Pentecost Sunday, is the Holy Spirit dwelling within you and empowering you to serve Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord?